<laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to close after that introduction, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's wonderful to be with you uh, this evening. I have a question. Has science somehow made belief in God obsolete? Um, has science, in one way or another, shown that those of us who believe in God are like people who believe in Santa Claus? That at the end of the day, belief in God is really belief in a fairy tale. And it can only be sustained by people who are needy and emotional and can't withstand serious, rigorous intellectual investigation. Unfortunately, a lot of movers and shakers in our culture today believe exactly that, that belief in God has been shown to be unneeded, false, and silly by modern science. For example, recently, a professor of biological science at, uh, at the Ivy League School, Cornell University, made the following statement, quote, let me summarize my views loudly and clearly. There are no gods. There are no purposes. There are no goal-directed forces of any kind. There's no life after death. When I die, I am absolutely certain that I am going to be dead, and that's the end for me. There's no ultimate foundation for ethics. There's no ultimate meaning to life. And there's no free will for humans either. If there's no ultimate meaning in life, it's odd that he would take the time to say so. <laughs> Apparently, he thought that that was a meaningful action. But in any case, this is a professor who speaks for a lot of people today who believe that science has somehow shown that belief in God is obsolete. Now, unfortunately, this is not limited to the upper echelons of the ivory tower. This attitude, and many of you have bumped up against this as you've tried to share your faith with people, this attitude is filtered down into the general culture. A few years ago, Time Magazine featured a cover story on how the universe will end. When you look at the story, it basically says that for centuries and indeed millennia, human beings have wanted to know how all this would end, but unfortunately, the article goes on to say, the only way that human beings had of answering their questions was through philosophy and religion, which basically amounts to nothing more than idle speculation. Now, for the first time in the history of the human race, Time Magazine tells us, science has finally moved into this area of investigation, and for the first time in our history, we have finally obtained real, solid answers to our questions about how the universe is going to end. Do you understand the attitude that is expressed towards science vis-a-vis -vis theology and philosophy in the Time Magazine article? The idea is that science is the only guide we have to knowledge of reality, and religion and theology and philosophy really amount to nothing but idle speculation. And in a world where more and more people believe that, it will be very, very difficult for them to take the gospel seriously. So I ask you, is this true? Is it really the case that science has somehow made belief in God unreasonable and indeed obsolete? Do those of us who profess belief in Jesus Christ and in the existence of a supreme being do so largely by an act of blind faith uh, or an expression of personal feeling? Is it really true that science has made belief in God obsolete? It will come as no surprise to you that I profoundly disagree with this sentiment, and I would like to give you four reasons why in the next few minutes that we have together. I want to share four reasons why I think it is not true that science has made belief in God obsolete. Number one, the claim that science is the only way we can know reality, as Time Magazine put it, cannot possibly be true because the claim is self-refuting. Let me say that again. The claim that science is the only way that we can know reality cannot possibly be true in spite of what Time Magazine says because the claim is self-refuting. You say, explain that. What does it mean for something to be self-refuting? What does that mean? Well, it means that it basically makes itself false. For example, 
the sentence, there are no sentences in English longer than three words, is self-refuting. The sentence itself is longer than three words. So the sentence refutes itself, or the statement uh, made uttering the sentence. Uh, the statement, I do not exist, is self-refuting. Uh, the statement, I can't speak a word of English, uh, is self-refuting. Uh, the statement that there are no truths is self-refuting. And the statement that there can be no knowledge of reality outside the hard sciences is not something that can be known through the hard sciences. In fact, if you think about it, the statement, we can't know reality outside the hard sciences, is not really a statement of science, it is a statement about science. Turns out it's actually a philosophical statement that says that we can't know philosophical statements. Let me illustrate this. Years ago, I was speaking at an evangelistic event in Baltimore, Maryland, and I was told that there was a very vicious atheist uh, who was a, had his PhD from Johns Hopkins University and been an engineer for 30 years, really hated Christianity, and a person was going to bring his boss uh, to this little evangelistic gathering where I was going to be sharing my faith. Well, I was at the hors d'oeuvre table before the event got going, and I saw this gentleman walk in the door with his boss. And sure enough, they made a beeline to the hors d'oeuvre table, and uh, this, this uh, friend of mine introduced me to this gentleman. And no sooner did we exchange pleasantries when he said, well, I understand that you're a philosopher and a theologian. And I said, well, I give it my best shot. <laughs> and he said, yeah, he said, I used to be interested in that myself when I was a teenager but I've outgrown it now because I realize now that if you can't test it and quantify your data and measure it in the laboratory, it's nothing but a bunch of idle speculation and hot air. You ever heard anybody express that attitude? A lot of people have that attitude. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. Well, I let him go for about another two minutes. And then I interrupted him and said, excuse me, but uh, I have a question I'm a little bit puzzled. If I understand you correctly, if you can't quantify something in the lab and test it scientifically, then the assertion is nothing but idle speculation, a bunch of hot air. And he said, that's absolutely right. He said, I've believed this for a long time. And I said, well, you've said 30 or 40 sentences uh, that have come out of your mouth in the last two minutes. And of the 30 or 40 things you've said, I can't think of a single thing that can be tested scientifically. <laughs> I said, if I'm wrong, would you show me which statement you've made that is scientifically testable? But if I'm right, you see my dilemma? <laughs> what you've been saying for the last two minutes is nothing but a bunch of <laughs> Well, he changed the subject very quickly. But, but the point is that when people tell you that science is the only way we can know things or it's the only thing that's true, uh, that statement can't be true and it can't be known to be true. And so statements like this are false. Science, ladies and gentlemen, is a wonderful gift from God, and I'll say that before I close again. But it is only one way of knowing reality. It's important, but there are many ways to know reality outside of science. And the statement that science is the only way we can know reality is not itself something that can be known by science. And it is a self-refuting claim. That's point number one. Point number two, 95% of science is completely irrelevant to Christianity. And 95% of Christian doctrine is irrelevant to science. You see, the vast majority of what scientists do have no relevance whatsoever to the Christian religion. I could frankly care less whether water is H2O or H3O. It doesn't bother me insofar as I'm a believer. Um, the chemical composition of a methane molecule, uh, the nature of igneous rock, or, uh, igneous rock rather, igneous rocks. That would be a theological issue <laughs> of igneous rock. The, these, are, these are areas of, the, of science that have little or nothing to do with, the, with Christian theology. On the other hand, debates about whether all the spiritual gifts are still available today, or debates about how to understand the Trinity, 
or debates between Calvinists and non-Calvinists over whether Christ died for just the elect or whether Christ died for everybody are matters of little interest as far as chemistry, physics, neuroscience, and geology are concerned. You have to understand that the overwhelming percentage of the issues dealt with in theology and in science have little or nothing to do with one another. And so 95% of science is just not of interest to a Christian theologian and conversely. So not only is the claim that science is the only way of knowing reality self-refuting, but the idea that somehow science is showing that the Christian religion is false or superstitious fails to appreciate the fact that virtually all of science has little or nothing to do with Christianity. This is a very, very important point to make. This is why those of you in this room that are engineers and scientists can go about most of your work without being too concerned about what you're doing as far as you're a Christian is concerned. Because if you're doing an acid-base reaction in a chemical lab, you're going to do it the same way a non-Christian scientist does it, and it won't make that much difference. <laughs> now, there is about 5% of what science claims that does interface directly with Christianity. 95% of it doesn't. But there's about 5%, a small percentage, of the, of the um, beliefs that scientists hold as scientists and the beliefs that thoughtful Christians hold that relate to one another. Now what I want to suggest to you is that a large number of that 5% that we discover in science has actually lent support to, to belief in God. Far from undermining belief in God, a large percentage of this 5% has actually lent support to belief in God. Let me give you some illustrations. First of all, we now know, beyond reasonable doubt, that the universe began to exist. Now, by the universe, I just mean the sum total of space, time, and matter. We now know that the material universe, the, the, the sum total of space, time, and matter, have, has not been here forever, that the universe began to exist. 